This is the Mastering Shiny Book Club. Um, please feel welcome to uh, watch this video. We will post it to YouTube following the uh, presentation. Um, today will be Brandon giving chapter 11 bookmarking. Um, go ahead and take it away, Brandon. Thank you, sir. All right. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. Um, so I'll start sharing my screen to present chapter 11. Um, and this is a shorter chapter, I think. So um, we'll have time to also get through the exercises too um, to review what we've learned. And so we've all done bookmarking before in some form or another, whether it's saving our web page or um, our place in a book, um, but we can do that in Shiny apps as well. However, by default, Shiny apps don't let you save the state of an app that you can return to later. And this is because it doesn't expose the current state of the app in its URL, at least not by default. Um, this bookmarking, however, is useful if you need to share the app or use it in the future with particular settings or a particular setup. So the objectives for today are to learn how to add the bookmark button to the UI, uh, to learn how to make the UI into a function and understand why that's necessary, to learn how to use uh, the enabled bookmarking um, equal to URL or server um, to the Shiny app call, and at the end of the chapter to be able to use bookmarking in uh, various types of ways. And so this is the outline, um, which also reflects the um, outline um, in the textbook. And is this font big enough for everyone? I wish I could make the margins bigger, like there's so much white space. <laughs> Agreed. Um, I, I think we're good. Um, Olu, are you uh, able to see everything as well? Yes, everything as well. All right, cool. Excellent. OK, so this chapter introduces bookmarking um, to Shiny apps so that you can conveniently return to a specific state of the app. As it stands, Shiny apps are what we call single page applications, a web app or website that interacts with the user by dynamically rewriting the current web page with new data from the server. Um, this is one of the major drawbacks um, of employing Shiny apps, as it's not the most convenient um, if you have to input the exact parameters in your application in order to produce the results you're trying to share um, every time. And so now with the bookmarking functionality, this problem is addressed, and the rest of this chapter is going to illustrate these concepts um, using a Shiny app proposed in exercise one. Although maybe this is from an older textbook. Um, we don't actually use this particular example, I don't think. Um, but we'll return to it when we cover the exercises. So modifying um, the app to be bookmarkable. There are three main parts that we have to modify in the Shiny app to make it um, bookmarkable. The first is to turn the UI into a function. The second is to add the bookmark button function. And the third is um, to insert within the Shiny app call enable bookmarking. And it says URL here, but can also be server. So we see that here, um, the UI is now turned into a function. Um, the bookmark button is inserted under the sidebar panel, although it could be put elsewhere within the UI. And under the Shiny App function, we enable bookmark. And so the example we're going to be working with is um, the one put in the textbook, which creates, I forget what they call this diagram. Um, maybe if I was in physics or engineering, I'd know, but um, allows you to create um, different illustrations. So we'll now cover the rationale for each step that we just talked about. So making the UI a function, um, why is this necessary? So this is because Shiny needs to be able to modify the input control specified by the URL. So as we know, function um, takes in um, unique inputs to generate an output. And so um, since that's what we need to do to make a bookmark, um, we need to make the UI a function. So like arguments are passed within a normal R function as parameters to produce different outputs, the UI now needs to take in an argument, which is the URL, in order to return the app into a particular state. The URL holds information on the input parameters that need to be changed, hence why the URL is now a function. So for the second step, adding the bookmark button to the app, 
this function adds a button to the UI and it captures the current values of all the input controls to generate the URL from it. We'll talk more about this later, um, but you can also, there are ways to do this automatically as well, so you don't have to press a button every time. And then the third component, enable bookmarking to the Shiny app call. This function puts the app together, so the UI and the server, adding this argument tells Shiny to enable bookmarking and that the bookmark will be URL encoded or saved onto the server. Um, again, more on this later. So first we'll break down what the URL is. Um, default URL that's generated from within the Shiny app will look something like this. Um, this is what it'll look like if um, you use the URL option, and this is what it'll look like if you use the server option. Um, and so there are three components that we'll highlight here. The first is the protocol, then the location of the app, and the parameters. Um, I believe, Ryan, you've touched on this before, um, talked about the port number and everything in the previous um, talk, so you can um, keep me on point. Well, that. we have, and, and I, if you don't mind, I was just going to highlight uh, the importance of that uh, uh, bottom image or the, 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 the highlighted text that you have here. So the protocol is obviously hypertext, right? We're, we're interacting from the browser to the server over this uh, hypertext uh, transfer protocol, HTTP. The second is obviously that URL address, and that's going to be uh, some form of resolution. Right now with 127.001, it's a loopback. It's just pointing back at your computer. What is important here is that we're accessing the world internet or, or accessing a, a common uh, potentially a dynamic uh, name resolution. So this could be, you know, Brendan's website and, and that would be populated in that URL. So we're pulling from the server's name uh, to populate that particular location. And then the port identification is just how we're communicating to the server. The third part, this is where things get really awesome, is now we're starting to um, pass almost like API type credential. And the, the important here is, is the question mark and then underscore. This is highlighted in the blue color that Brendan has on his screen. Um, that question mark underscore is now uh, passing in arguments to that function that we created, that UI function that we created, uh, or server function that we created. And that input passing back into this particular URL, this, this server that we're interacting with, this uh, Shiny server, uh, that API call is what is used to generate the previous bookmarked uh, request. Now it's manipulable. Uh, you can change this. You, you can actually interact at this API level. And I believe that's what the next section is going to, to get into is where we can start to change, modify, or update this call to this particular server. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Brendan, I wanted to that's highlight it. the importance there. No, that's good stuff. And just to expand on what you said, so you talked about how um, the parameters here specify um, the exact contents of the web page. And so um, they're all separated by an ampersand or the and sign. And so you can see here there are um, one, two, three, four unique parameters. And so as you can see for damping delta, these all specify some part of the state of your web app um, that we'll be able to return to later. So for updating the URL, it's probably more convenient to have the URL just update itself whenever inputs change, instead of having the user press a button each time the state must be captured. And this can be done by wrapping information like input values and session information around an observer. Um, as shown below. And the reactive values to list input step does what you might expect um, in as.list to do in base R. It takes the reactive object um, input and stores its values and dependencies in the list. The next step um, invokes the do bookmark function from the session object. Um, the session object is an environment that can be used to access information on functionality relating to the session. So do bookmark invokes the on bookmarked callback function. Um, and a callback function um, is just a function that's passed as an argument in another function. So it'll be called back at a later time, hence the name. 
a function that accepts other functions as arguments is called a higher order function, which contains a logic for when the callback function gets executed. Although this first sentence is the more important part. And this is all discussed, actually not covered directly in the text per se, but within the advanced bookmarking blog that I'll put in the chat um, that they link to in the text, but don't explicitly cover, I don't think. Um, are there any questions on that? On do bookmark or um, exactly these functions do? If not, I'll go to talk about storing a richer state. So URL bookmarking is simple and works everywhere you may want to deploy your Shiny app. However, it could become very long if you have a lot of inputs. So um, as we talked about earlier in the previous page, um, for each input, there's an ampersand, then it specifies you know, the parameter. So it could be delta, meaning value. You can imagine if you have 50 of these, so you're doing um, a Monte Carlo simulation for your Shiny app and have 20 parameters, you know, you don't want to have a really long URL. Um, and so um, in this case, Shiny saved the state of your app in an RDS file um, on the server, um, generates a shorter and easier URL. To do this, you can simply change the enable bookmarking argument to be server instead of URL as shown here. Um, I'm trying to remember if there are any other options um, for enable bookmarking. I think that's it, or those are the main two at least that are most important, um, server and URL. And so this generates URLs that look like this. Um, so as we discussed before, um, these are the parameters. Um, this is the this is HTTP and this is um, the location of where it is on your computer exactly. Um, and so the parameter in this instance is the state ID, which corresponds uh, to a directory in your working directory. And so be sure to have a mechanism that routinely deletes these directories or cleans it up. Um, if your app requires bookmarking in a complex state and you don't delete these files, your app is going to take up uh, much more space and start to lag eventually. Um, when you do delete these files, their corresponding URLs will also stop working. Though. And so you have to watch out for that. So just be sure to either send updated links to your stakeholders or collaborators and be mindful of the state of your app. Um, based on your reaction right now, I don't know if you have any experience with this sort of similar situation or just general cleanliness of your disk space for apps. I would say that the 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 more so system management or or server management uh, and and not being able to delete or have some mechanism to remove those. RDS files, uh, and you have a lot of traffic uh, actively pursuing your your particular web server that you're you're hosting your your shiny app on. Um, this could overwhelm or, or or run out of space. You if 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 you have this save bookmarking um, option or enable bookmarking server on this this option, it will create large quantities of information stored on the server. You, with a unique uh, a serial ID that can pull up that RDS file. Uh, and so kind of your what you're, you're doing is instead of allowing the user to save that bookmark local to their machine and then be able to pass it as a URL argument into the server, <clears throat> by hosting it on the server's side, you are shortening the URL. Okay. Now you've got a unique identifier that you're, you're passing or requesting from the server, um, but now you're putting that Ownness or responsibility on the server to manage or store that that web link. Um, I I'm not saying it's good or bad. I, I it's 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 just the the nature in which you're wanting to choose who uh, owns that. Um, I believe if you're using Shiny IO as a place to host this information from, um, I believe I'll double check this, but I believe Shiny IO uh, will. Uh, purge after a period of time those uh, past RD, RDS files um, because it is a free service. Uh, there is some housekeeping in the background that will get rid of those uh, serialized RDS uh, links. So, mm -hmm. right. Just to keep that in mind, um, it's always a cost uh, benefit uh, analysis when you're, when you're hosting or creating these bookmarks. Um, do you want the user to take the responsibility or 
uh, I'll make the URL faster, easier, and smaller for you if, if we host it on the server. But uh, like I said, if you have a lot of people interacting with that, that space, that storage is going to grow exponentially large. Right, right. Yeah, and they talk about um, having a mechanism to, you know, claim your uh, dis or um, clear up this space. But um, I imagine that just looks like manually deleting the files. Or, no, um, so in in most cases, and I, I didn't mean to interrupt. I apologize. In most cases, you're going to set up some form of cron job. Uh, so think of it as a timer. Maybe like every, you know, week uh, or every month, you're just going to go in and kind of uh, request or, or create that server side logic, this cron job to go in and say, purge you know, anything in this particular directory. Maybe it's you know, some temp directory that you're, you're mounting for the, the Shiny server to store all of this media in. So you just go in and you know, nuke whatever was contained in there and, and re recover that memory space. Right, okay. Sorry, what'd you say that was called? Cron is the utility that I'm referring to, uh, but there's there's other services that may be able to do this as well. Um, my reference I'm making is more on a Linux server mindset. Uh, so let me see if I can find the manual page for Cron, and it might give you some idea of kind of how this works in the background of the the server's side. It had has no direct relation to Shiny as a as an application. Okay. Yeah, so while Ryan searches for that in the background, we can talk a bit more about um, some bookmarking challenges or things you have to think about um, when creating these bookmarks. So you have to be extra cautious if your app relies on random number generation. So bookmarking will not generate the same results unless you make your process reproducible. Um, so you have to make sure to set some sort of seed. Um, the suggested solution is to use the repeatable function, which comes from uh, the Shiny library. It returns a wrapped version of a random data function that always uses the same seed when called. And so an example is um, R norm A, um, you use the repeatable function. And now your function R norm, which randomly generates um, uh, numbers from a normal distribution, is now in R norm A. So, so now you, you use R norm A as R norm, except it's now reproducible in your shiny app. That makes sense. And so be sure to give your tabs an ID also when using tab set panel. Um, be cautious of what you share. So if your app requires um, sensitive information, you set bookmark exclude somewhere in the server to ensure that they um, don't get included within your bookmark. And so you would set bookmark exclude, and then these are all the parameters that um, you want to keep a secret. So if you use reactive values to manually manage your, your reactive state, um, use on bookmark instead of on bookmarked. Um, this will be discussed more in chapter 16, and again, more in that um, blog post or web page on advanced bookmarking. As well as an exercise too, I believe. Um, we utilize on bookmark at least. Um, so yeah, that covers all the content of the chapter. Are there any questions or general remarks? Um, things like that. Uh, thanks for sharing that link, Brian. One of the topics that comes up with bookmarking in general, and if anybody in the space of web development um, wants to jump in and add content as well, um, we have these shortened services, right? Like uh, Bitly is, a, is an example. Um, you create a, a uh, user account. I pass in this really long, arduous URL, you know, thousands of characters long. It's, it's very hard to manage and, and, and throw around uh, emailing to people, et cetera. Uh, so you, you create this Bitly link. And when you use a service like Bitly, um, it's almost considered almost like a sub DNS, but I don't want it. I don't want to confuse anybody with what I'm referring to and that uh, uh, dynamic um, host uh, namespace DNS servers are, are kind of the IP address to what we humans would use as www.sumaddress.com. 
um, that resolution on the world's internet is how DNS operates. At any rate, Bitly creates a shortened version that is easier to post on Twitter, easier to post in, in certain uh, user spaces that, that require limited characters. <clears throat> I can't post a thousand character URL in a Twitter post, it's not going to work. So when we are activating these more advanced topics of Shiny and, and, and bookmarking in general, you can, you can think of this bookmark and bookmarked as two of the ways in which you're, you're kind of creating those. Um, the secret keys and all that uh, nuance as well is just a, a uh, way of assurance. Uh, you don't, I'll go back to the, uh, an earlier topic and I'm sorry, Brendan, I'm talking way too much here. No worries. Anytime you host any web service, you always have to keep in mind that there's a security risk involved. When you put anything out to the world's internet, realize that it's not just the intended purposes of that shiny server that's going to be accessed. There are other bots, there are other web crawlers that are also accessing and potentially compromising your web server. Uh, so security is always a, a critical nature. And I don't want to impose any paranoia <laughs> in that nature. Uh, we have uh, tools and, and mechanisms to prevent us from uh, being compromised, but it's just, I, I always want to put that out there that security is key. Um, do not trust everything that uh, uh, you put out on the internet. Uh, it may be accessed in a nefarious way. So um, I always smile that uh, when you manipulate web URLs, um, you may get unexpected results from the web server and you can pwn, you can take over, you can compromise that, that web service in that manner. I'm not telling anybody how to be a hacker. I'm just showing that there are other ways if you're not uh, familiar with it. So, yeah, yeah cool. Yeah, I hadn't thought about it in that way, but now I will. <laughs> um, okay, I mean, I still have a lot of time, so don't feel like you're intruding or anything for anyone else as well. Um, so we'll just cover the exercises, which should be fairly quick as well, because there are only two of them. Um, although I'll admit the first one kind of um, used most of my brain power last night. So then I just caved in and Googled the solution for the next one. And so I guess before I'll just, while I'm talking about that, um, link everyone to this great shiny solutions book um, from Maya Gans and Marley Gotti, um, who should get full credit for the second solution because I really just copied and pasted um, what they said. But I'll talk about the first solution first where I actually did the work and we can also scrutinize my code. Um, so for the first one, um, they're asking us to generate an app. Um, and specifically an app for visualizing the results of ambient noise simplex. And this comes from um, this ambient package. And you put in all these parameters, uh, frequency, fractal, octaves, and then what you get is um, random noise. So simplex noise is specifically just a kind of noise, I believe. Um, honestly, I didn't even know the different kinds of noises. There's curling, simplex, um, but that's what it does. Um, and so they're asking us to create this app um, with um, the noise simplex function. And so your app should allow the user to control the frequency, fractal, lacunarity, and gain, and be bookmarkable. Um, how can you ensure that the image looks exactly the same when reloaded from the bookmark? Um, and as a hint, think about what the seed argument implies and how to use it. And so I'll let everyone sort of just take a moment to think about maybe the structure of their app if they were to um, create such a solution, try to think again about the components of um, making a bookmark. Um, and then I have the code here, but I'll run the app later um, so you can see what it looks like. So we have all the libraries we need. We didn't um, need GR devices, but I put it here um, just because we're generating the plot, that's what, um, the package, or what, that's what their documentation uses an example of. They need to use that package. But anyways, not very important. Um, the more important part is um, the actual UI and server part, where, um, again, we create a function of the UI. And our bookmark button I've placed on the bottom here. 
and we have all of our inputs for everything they asked for. So that's the frequency, fractal, lactinearity, and gain. Um, all is, well, most of them are slider inputs. This is um, fractal as a discrete set of choices. And then um, we plot um, all of the noise um, on the main panel. So in order to make it reproducible, um, I've used the repeatable function and I've stored the noise simplex, which generates our noise into a repeatable noise simplex, or that's what I've named it. Um, and I've set the seed um, to, a rent, to a number, so 905 in this case. Um, and then um, this does the back end work of um, creating the noise simplex function or taking in the inputs. And then we render the plot um, like so. And so I'll see if I can generate it here for everyone and then demonstrate the bookmark functionality. Um, yeah, I think this is it. Okay, so here are all of our parameters. And so when we adjust it, um, it'll generate some different kind of noise. And I'm curious about the application of this is, but anyways, um, that's what we do here. And so if we want to um, bookmark it, um, I have, oh yeah, by the way, I have it set to the server. So it's saved on the server instead, um, so I put it online. And so um, here's the link that we generate. I'll copy that. And actually, let me try to adjust it so there's more dis like a distinguishable type of white noise or noise in the image. That way you can see that it's the same type of image when I um, put it, um, when I regenerate it or restore the state. I, I guess it's all noise, so it's not going to look very distinguishable. Um, <laughs> I was hoping there were, I could like generate bigger dots or something. Um, can I do that? Honestly, I don't even know what I'm doing or how any of these functions work. Um, no worries there. You're definitely getting some good applications, uh, <laughs> some good random input. <laughs> All right. So just try to remember what this image looks like. It's not very distinguished, but um, hopefully it'll look the same or familiar enough um, when I say um, try to reproduce it. You can do this, right? I mean, paste it. Um, yeah, and so this should be the same image, definitely the same input parameters. Um, and so that's what the app does. And let's say that's just a demonstration. And so stop running this. Okay. Um, and does that make sense? Um, any questions, well, comments, or critiques? It does that? now. So, so with using the, the server side storage of that RDS file, I have reason to believe somewhere on your machine in presentation, we would be able to access the temp URL of that. Well, let me rephrase that comment. We should be able to access in your computer, the memory space that represents your serialized stored RDS file, right? The arguments to recreate that. Now, it's not just remember, this is very extremely optimized. So the snapshot of what Brendan was showing the save bookmark, it's not taking a snapshot of that uh, information. It's only the variables that would previously be used in the user's side bookmarking, right? This really long URL. All it's doing is saving those parameters. But just remember, anytime you save anything on the server's end, uh, or hosting in, in that concept, even at, at, at you know small bits or bytes of, of memory, it does add up. And you will, if you're hosting a really large server and a lot of activity, think like not Discord, but something of the nature, you know, where where a lot of people are are posting stuff. Um, it's going to take up space, and it, and it will eventually. So, Brendan, somewhere in your machine, somewhere on your computer, uh, this because you're running your web server at, uh, you know, port 4438, there is allocated memory space for that service to operate, for that server to operate by using the bookmarked 
uh, server end storage, that's memory space is now somewhere on your machine. Right. Just to make a reference, if you don't mind, I was going to expand just briefly on the relationship between the UI and server. Um, mm -hmm. I'm always wanting uh, our, our Shiny app staff or Shiny team uh, to always remember this relationship between UI and server. Um, it's, it's a good exercise or a good um, place to be to compare what's happening above and what's happening below. So as an example, we, uh, we have our side panel fractal, um, sorry, frequency, fractal, uh, lacunarity, and then gain. So these are slider input named slider inputs. If we go to the bottom of Brendan's uh, script and look at lines 28, 29, 30, and 31, right? So those four input frequency, input fractal, input uh, lacunarity, and then input gain, that's the relationship between your UI and your server. So we're creating that slider input. We want that object slider on our web browser. And then the server is expecting that named variable, named object on the UI to pass that information back into the server uh, with that input um, reference. So mm -hmm. this is a, often at an earlier stage of Shiny. Uh, this is the one thing that everyone kind of scratches their head at. But um, when you start to break down the relationship of those named variables between UI and server, um, it starts to make sense. And it, it just add one more comment here. If you are generating a large web service, okay, a large shiny app, there's a lot of team development going into it. Um, Brendan, I know in your, in your current college profession that you may be accessing some very large information uh, or, or, or team members that are working on this particular shiny app. In that case, it may be important for you to break apart the UI.R and the server.R. Um, when you create a Shiny app, there's a choice that you can make whether you want it on one file, like you have this app.R that has both functions, or you can make it as a two file setup. And there's, uh, it's not in Mastering Shiny yet. We'll get to it at a later point, but in more advanced Shiny books, uh, engineering production grade. Shiny apps. Um, Colin Fay makes a reference to the importance of management in the future of your app. Okay. Right now, these are very small um, exercises, but if you're if you're doing this for a production or doing this for a job, um, managing it in a larger dynamic is important too. And so the relationship of those uh, named variables between your UI and your server, um, when you break it apart in two files, it it often becomes slightly confusing to remember which is which. So again, making that reference now. Right. Yeah, for sure. And sorry, what would you recommend in that case? Um, like if there'd be any changes to this code to make it more distinguishable? Uh, well, so, so ultimately what you're going to do, if you were to create this two file setup, right? This, this server and UI, um, two things, well, three. First is your, UI and your server should be fairly small. It, 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 the, the, the text on that should be fairly small because what you're accessing now is instead of having, you wouldn't be managing a CSS, you'd be managing some JavaScript, you'd be managing some functional calls that may be in a different directory and that I'm accessing our, our other book clubs when I'm making that reference. So the Shiny app itself is, in, uh, managed in a larger context in a, more locations, you would be able to bring from memory what that particular function call is, or you would be able to bring from memory what that named variable would be between these different um, uh, use cases, your, your slider input fractal, and then you know fractal input fractal. Those two points, you would know that fractal is the is the variable name common between UI and server, and so you would be able to pass back and forth between those. Um, does that help? Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, I feel like the best experience would just be to try and deploy one of these things. I don't think I've 
ever found a practical setting in which to do so. Um, right. Like in academia, it'll be a while, but um, good point. Maybe I'll get an internship in industry. Good point. Um, but yeah, um, any ways we can go to the um, second question? Um, this is one in which um, I'll be reviewing the code in more depth for the first time as well, because um, like I said, I can't take any credit for the solution. Um, but the second problem um, is slightly different. So they're asking us to make a simple app that lets you upload a CSV file and then bookmark it. Um, so upload a few files and then look in shiny bookmarks. Um, how do the files correspond to the bookmarks? Um, they give us a hint they can use the read RDS to look inside the cache files that shiny is generating. So for the solution, um, I like that they explain um, the rationale and the broad outline of what they did. So by setting the state values data equal to the data reactive, we can store the contents of the uploaded CSV. Um, looking in the shining bookmarks folder, we see an input RDS, which has the same four arguments as the input file. And those four arguments are the name, size, type, and data path. All of these except the data path are the same as when we upload the file. Rather than the temporary location, the file is saved to within the entire shining session the data path becomes um, 0.csv, which is a CSV file created within the same folder um, as our input RDS. And so I, I can, there are a lot of moving parts there. You know, it can be hard to follow, especially um, when they talk about these concepts. Um, I think that's covered more in the advanced bookmarks um, post that was not covered here. Um, so I urge you to check that out later. Um, and so for the code, actually we'll cover it because I have it here and then we'll see how it runs. Um, so again, all the components to creating a bookmark, turning the UI into a function. Um, their bookmark button is at the top of the sidebar panel. And so um, this is where it takes in a CSV file and um, it generates output. Um, of your CSV file in the form of a table. Um, it creates um, a reactive of the input file, um, displays um, some of the contents. So I believe like the first five or six rows, um, sets the state um, to the DF reactive. And so this is where we use the on bookmark, which is the callback function we talked about. Um, and then we restore, um, set df to the state later. So we use the on restore function. So um, I should probably look up the documentation for on restore again. Um, but someone can correct me, I believe, like you use this um, when you return to the state, um, when you bookmark it, and then um, you say you paste it in your browser and you're returning, um, you want to return to the original table. Um, this is where the on restore function um, is being used. And so, you know what, let's figure it out by running the app and then we can see its functionality as well. Okay, so uh, this, is this because there's just no CSV file? It's, um, oh, I realize the internet can see this. I don't think I have any classified files. Um, let's try this. Okay, so yeah, I think this is a blank file, it's just the variable names. And so we see here, um, this is from an experiment or setting up an experiment I have. You can see participant session. Um, so we can bookmark this. Um, oh, by the way, okay, yeah, store was set to server. So I should be able to reproduce it just by pasting it here. And so yeah, then I'll get the same um, the same table output with the CSV file. And 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 what's important here to uh, the the viewer? Um, so with your active shiny server running, that's that's important to remember that when we passed. Or, sorry, paste this bookmarking element back into and then be able to pull from our memory the CSV file and then rendering it on the page. It's it's because your 
server is actively running in as a test, but I don't want to recreate or, or compromise the, the current nature in which you're presenting. But if you were to stop your server on the shiny's end, okay, so if you go back to R and you literally stop your server and then you try to paste that URL back in, it's not going to know where it, what you're talking about because quote unquote, the server's not running anymore. The shiny application that we know of the server side is not actively running anymore. So the the thread or the call to that shiny application is no longer valid. Now, I don't know, this is this is one that I'm not, I'm not sure of. If you start that service over again and then paste that URL in, if it's going to uh, uh, pull that memory back up, it should because it is still on your computer. Um, so yeah, if we go back in and to the browser and then refresh again, it should pull it up. Yeah. Yes, because at that memory space, that RDS file, that that link that we're pay, passing into it, now has a ability, a a a function, or a, or a, I'm trying to say some level of work. It knows how to access that memory and then render that onto your browser again, even right. with the server down now. No, it's a good point. Highlighting the differences between the URL and server side is dependent on. Um, shiny up running here um, and so yeah i realized in both my exercises i don't have an example where i actually use url instead um, but i imagine that's the more common application in a lot of ways although i, I don't know um, yeah and so reflecting back on it i wish i, ex I could explain or dive deeper into um, particular functions that answer this question or this exercise, like on bookmark or on store and enable bookmarking. Um, but um, you're welcome to cover that as well. Again, in this web page, as well as um, in these slides we touched on earlier. Um, that pretty much covers it. Um, speaking of covering things better, um, they're not just one, two, but three cohorts that possibly do a better job than this. So you can also check those out if, uh, if you'd like. Uh, I think in our in our cohort two that uh, I attended, it was uh, Connor, I believe, did bookmarking uh, for us. And he it was a, a really fun exercise. He's got a, a uh, app that he's working with in um, real estate, uh, being able to look at a geographic region and then kind of almost like Zillow where you pull open, you know, all of the various housing and, and uh, rentals and, and et cetera, and then be able to do some demographic type details on it. It was kind of a, a neat setting, but with the bookmarking topic, he was showing how being able to interact with his application, you know, a, a, a client or somebody that would be using his shiny service can pull back in and render access that memory space over again. And so that was a neat, uh, neat topic to convey. I haven't watched cohort one. I, I don't know who, who presented this. Uh, Frederica may be uh, able, I think she was part of that cohort one group, but. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, I wish um, maybe if I, if I'm more organized, I try to create my own shiny application um, rather than just textbook examples. That sounds cool. Yeah. Well, and, and I do want to pass to the group uh, as a whole, one of the, the learning points that was important in Shiny and in web development in general is create your own server, actually create your own space, and then be able to manipulate and manage Shiny within that service. Now, there's various ways you can do that. Virtual machines, you can create a Docker instance of, of your RStudio and then you know, create a Shiny app off of that. There's ways that you can, you can generate or manipulate this output. Shiny IO is, is a hosted service uh, free application that uh, you, can, you can access and utilize as well. The point is, your, Brendan, you asked a very good question earlier about um, a way to exercise some of this media, because when you're interacting with the application, you're, you're working through bugs, you're learning how some of these commands operate, um, creating that server space also um, adds an, a, another element or a deeper element to how 
some of these operations uh, work or just web development works in general. And that's uh, rewarding uh, overall. I'd be more than happy and, and give you some guidance on directions to go in that respect as well. But yeah, that sounds good. Um, and I agree. Like, I think I learned the most um, one by teaching this, but also or presenting this, but one by doing the exercises. So um, I know not all chapters um, have the exercises, but the few where I've done them, that's where I remember the concepts the best. So I have to go back and do them again. Well, with that said, um, we, we still have eight minutes left in our, maybe eight minutes, we'll say approximately eight minutes in our presentation. Um, next week is scheduled for chapter 12, which is dynamic something. Give me one moment and I'll pull that name up. Uh, tidy evaluation, tidy evaluation. We don't have anybody currently signed up. I'm tempted to throw my name into the hat. Uh, it's been a, a, quite a while since I've given a presentation. I think that probably be appropriate to the to the group as a whole. Um, again, Lucy, uh, uh, we're going to be our studio conference is going to be going on uh, this coming week, and there'll be both workshops and also the uh, the long presentations. Brendan, do you recall, there's nothing happening on Saturday, is there? Um, I didn't look at the schedule. Yeah, I don't know the schedule. Um, let me take a closer look at that and I'll post it on Slack. I What I what most of the book clubs, are for ds learning communities, uh, book clubs are, are aware of, we don't wanna compromise any of our team attending the conference as well. It's a, it's a respect between the two parties and uh, attention span, I guess. I'll look at the schedule to confirm whether or not next week we have the conference that may be uh, going on on Saturday morning. I don't think that's the case, but I'll double check. It looks like it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't think it would go into the weekend. Uh, I think it probably concludes on Friday. But uh, with that said, I'll go ahead and throw my name into tidy evaluation, and then the next. After that would be, um, Olu, if you're still with us, uh, we've got you down for mastering reactivity, both in, uh, introduction and then why to use the reactivity chapters, chapter 13. Um, are you still good with that? Yes. Okay, excellent. So the coming weeks will be, I'll, I'll, again, I'll take that responsibility. So myself and then Olu. Um, Brendan, you're coming back again with chapter 14, the reactive graph. Yes. Um, please feel welcome and please, I, I, I implore you, um, ask if you need any help with that reactive graph. Uh, look at Colin's, uh, Colin Berkey's uh, presentation for this chapter. I think it spanned a couple of weeks, if I'm not mistaken. It's a fairly large topic, but the uh -huh. reactive graph is really fun to work with. Um, and it's, it's, some, it's some awesome access under the hood of Shaney uh, with okay, reactive, cool. so yeah. Yeah, thanks for the heads up. I'll try to get started yeah. earlier then. You bet. Um, okay, if there's no other questions, uh, I'm I'm good. Olu, are you? Do you have any questions for Brendan? No, I don't have question. I'm okay. Thank you. Excellent. All right. Well, Brendan, thank you for your time and, and great presentation, sir. No worries. Yeah, thank you both as well, and I'll see everyone next week. Thank you. All right. Talk to you all soon. Right. Bye bye. bye.